What does a Trump White House mean for Michigan? Plus the next steps for regional transit. And one on one with Domino CEO Patrick Doyle on Michigan education and business. Stay put. My week starts right now. Did you know Gordon Food Service was started by a 23 year old entrepreneur as a butter and egg delivery business more than a century ago. In 1948, school teacher Gerard Wendell Hayworth borrowed $10,000 from his parents to start a woodworking operation in his family's garage. It's now Hayworth Incorporated. These are just some of the ways Michigan's pioneers started out as small companies with big ideas. We are business leaders for Michigan. We are committed to making Michigan a top 10 state for jobs, personal income, and a healthy economy. Funding is also provided by Delta. Welcome to My Week. I'm Christy McDonald. You know, there are no shortage of headlines in terms of the transition of power in Washington, protests and pontificating about the leadership of a President Trump. So we are going to narrow our focus a little bit and talk about the impact of a Trump presidency on Michigan, how potential policies will affect us here and what President Trump will need to do to satisfy the Michigan voters who turned out for him. We'll also debate a possible plan B for regional transit. And you'll hear from Domino's Pizza CEO Patrick Doyle. His thoughts on Michigan education and business. So let's get started with our MyWeek contributors, Nolan Finley of the Detroit News and Stephen Henderson of the Detroit Free Press. Gentlemen, how are you? It's good, good to see you. Yeah, it's been ready a. Ready for the year to be over. Are you ready for the year to be over? Wait, <laughs> you think, think you are. think it's going to be any less busy once 2017 <laughs> starts? I just need that that last two weeks of the year where everything slows down a little and everyone's a little quieter. Do you think everyone I would will like be that a little bit? Now. Is that is that your is that your holiday wish or is yeah, that no, a? Uh, well, it ha it happens for me because I just leave. <laughs> I just go I away. I had a new granddaughter this morning. Well, congratulations, Papa. That is Thank wonderful. Yeah. That's wonderful. All right, so there are good things to celebrate in the world, <laughs> but there are also some very interesting things to talk over, and I think if you uh, get through a lot of the headlines that we've seen coming out of the what will president-elect Trump's um, administration look like, I want to take a look at how any of his policies and any of the things that he wants to push through now, how it will impact Michigan. Nolan, if you take a look at some of the things that he's talking about, what do you think are the key things that's going to impact Michigan? You know, I think there's reason for hope and reason for concern in his proposals. Um, if he can deliver on tax and regulatory leave, relief, it will help the Michigan manufacturing economy. I think if we, he can repatriate the tax money dollars or the revenue that's sitting overseas, uh, I think that'll create a tremendous economic boom in the country and investment in, in hard assets, in manufacturing plants, et cetera. So I think that's the hopeful part. If he carries through on this threat to start trade wars with Mexico and China, that's going to be really hard on the Michigan economy. Mark Field said in Los Angeles this week that that 35 percent tariff he proposes on goods imported or on cars imported from Mexico would devastate the auto industry. And if the auto industry is hurt, the economy is hurt. Similar, the, similarly, the 45 percent tariff on goods from China going to drive up the cost of everything we buy. I hope he can't get that through a Republican Congress and won't even try because that would be really bad for the for the economy. And, and hurting the working class men and women who are the ones who turned out, uh, many of them, to vote for Donald Trump. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, if you look also at the tax plans that he's put out, the income tax plans, most of the middle class would see a tax increase under Donald Trump's plans. I'm not sure that's and, true. And, uh, and certainly some of the, the, some of the working class folks who turned out for him would also see that. The people who would get tax breaks are upper income earners uh, who, who are, of course, now dominating the early days of this administration as well. Uh, this idea that somehow he's going to reform uh, you know, corporate taxes to repatriate that money. I, I, why would that happen when uh, his chief economic guy is likely to be uh, someone from Goldman Sachs, for why instance? Why wouldn't it happen? Why wouldn't Goldman Sachs want that money here? Everybody wants that money back. Barack Obama wanted that money back, sure. and he wanted a lower corporate tax rate, never got around to pushing it through. Everybody wants that money to come back here. It's yeah, being we'll double taxed, and if it comes back, but as far as tax, the tax plan I saw was a... You, there's a place you can was, go online, put in your income, and see what happens. Uh, try it. I mm -hmm. mean, it, it, it's an astoundingly high number 
uh, that you get to before you get to a tax what, lawyer. What I saw proposed was a 25 uh, a increase in the personal deduction to $25,000. If you get that, you, you've got any couple making less than 50000 would pay no taxes, and a big chunk of the middle class would see big, yeah. big reductions. You've got to go to the, you so go to the calculator. That goes through, and, and well, the, who's running, I'd have to know is, who's running the calculator. Tax policy is really <laughs> complicated, and this is the thing. I mean, this is a guy who's, who's offered push-button answers to complex questions, and when you sort of add that complexity to uh, what he says he wants to do, you see that what he says is going to be the effect is probably not going to be. You know, and a lot of people who voted for him, and not just in Michigan, but around the country, were saying, you know, we, we need jobs and we want more jobs. Um, and, and the job creation, we haven't quite heard, um, you know, the, the, the plans from him on that. And that's not very easy. When he's talking about maybe big infrastructure projects, I'm not sure that's totally in line with the Republican Congress that he's going to be working with as well. Well, I mean, he is proposing major infrastructure projects, and that represents jobs. Um, Keystone Pipeline represents jobs. But all also, if you untie uh, these regulations from the economy and free up businesses to invest and to grow, I think you create jobs that way. We are under a huge regulatory burden in this country. It's something like 70,000 new pages of, of regulations each year over the last four or five years. That's choking off growth. And if you could unleash that and let the economy grow, I think that creates jobs. Yeah, it may, but it can also create disaster. Let's think about what happened here in the state of Michigan. One of the first things that Governor Rick Snyder did was loosen up regulations around Department of Environmental Quality, for instance, it disinvested in that agency. One of the first things out of the gate was saying, we don't need this to be so involved in everything. Well, where did that agency fail us? That agency failed us in Flint. Uh, failed to identify what was going. But not from what understaffing. Was going, well, uh, from, from lack of investment. Well, I mean, you cut the money, and we have the worst environmental disaster in the in the history of the state. The idea that those are somehow dissociated is absurd. And, and, since you and, since you since you did bring that up, I mean, it, it also bears repeating that uh, Donald Trump has talked about making the EPA just an advisory, yeah, right, uh, in, you know, right advisory um, <laughs> we'll have department. All over well, and that, it's also that something has to think been about the when most you're looking at the state who government. lives right you on the Great Lakes. You ask any farmer who's had to live under Listen. their thumb, and you know, it's easy to sit here. You know, in, in in an urban area, and, and talk about the EPA. You want to know why he did so poorly in rural areas? The EPA can be faulted. If you have a farm, if you're a farmer, you don't own or control your land at all. So, so again, there's this delicate balance between the idea of over regulation and consumer citizen protection. The government's first obligation is to protect its citizens. That failed us here in the state of Michigan in Flint because of the kind of disinvestment in regulatory schemes. All I'm saying is if Donald Trump follows the same blueprint uh, that he's talked about, that Governor Snyder talked about, we are likely to see the same kinds of effects, these, the same consequences. These agencies have all been about protecting government power and expanding their own authority. If you look at Dodd-Frank, for example, Dodd-Frank, we've known it's not working. Uh, the, this Democratic Congress refused to change it. It's, it's keeping the home market down in Detroit and other urban areas, harder to, harder to get loans, harder for small business. Community banks have all but died off under, under Dodd-Frank. But the repeal it, of Glass-Steagall was what led to the housing crisis. So, I mean, this idea that, that somehow deregulating the market makes things better is not always true. All right, Dodd, I wanna, I wanna, Dodd Frank certainly wasn't the answer. Well, it, has it, was, hurt, it was part it of an hurt answer. Urban areas and, and it's rural part of the areas answer. alike. It, it needs it's fixing. Not, it, it, it doesn't needs, need okay. repeal. It probably right. needs repeal. I had to pull you back around to um, to some of the other things that Donald Trump is talking about doing once he mm -hmm. comes in office that could impact Michigan. And I want to look at immigration, um, where he's talking about deportation. Um, you know, there's also fear among the Arab American community and the Muslim community yeah. that he's going to make people register. Um, and, and I think that that could have, a, that's a, a grave impact yeah. on people here in our state as yeah. well. Yeah, I mean, you're, you're, you're talking about a throwback to the 1930s. Uh, when we were talking about, when they're talking about this in Europe with uh, Jewish citizens, uh, and then we did it here in this country during the Second World War with Japanese citizens. I mean, these are arguments we've had before, and, and these are shameful parts of our past uh, that today most people would say, well, gee, we shouldn't have done that. Uh, that was not in in uh, in concert with the, the the ideals that this country supposedly was founded on. Uh, this is a guy heading us back in that direction to reopen debate about obviously uh, uh, 
obviously, I think, unconstitutional kind of behavior. But even if you don't think it's unconstitutional, it's not America. Is there cause for concern here, Nolan, oh, or do we need that's, to see That's why we were next. concerned throughout the campaign with that rhetoric. Um, I'm looking at what he's been saying since he was elected president. The immigration ban suddenly disappeared from his website. The other day on Leslie Stahl's interview on CBS, he said, well, let's, let's concentrate first on deporting the two or three million criminal um, illegal immigrants we have in this country, and then we'll figure out the rest later. Well, that's exactly the same policy the Obama administration has been pursuing, deporting um, criminals and leaving everybody else alone. So I think you're going to have yeah, to see how he carries this you've out. You've seen mm -hmm. uh, the advisors to his transition team said just today that they are already preparing uh, for this registry, this Muslim registry, that, that they're going to ask Muslim uh, immigrants and visitors <laughs> to this country to register. So don't pretend like they've just walked away from this stuff. They haven't. And the, the bigger issue is that uh, we haven't seen enough people stand up and say, this is un-American, right? Mike Rogers, uh, wonderful congressman from the mm -hmm. state of Michigan, was part of the transition team, Is walked out, out walked out this yep. week saying that, you know, I, I assume he saw something with, with regard to foreign policy that bothered him. What he should have said was, look, these are also people pursuing bigoted policies that, that contravene uh, the constitution of this country. He got tossed out. He didn't walk out. Mike well, got tossed out said, in a power in a power struggle. He was a supporter of Trump all along. I don't think, think he's going to turn on him now. Well, and that's and one of the problems inside that I'm part. encouraged. You know, there's a lot of, of worrisome stuff there. I'll agree with you. I'm, this is not my guy. But I'm encouraged to see Paul Ryan still in place in the Congress. I think he's a reasonable um, uh, check on presidential power. And I think the last thing you're going to see or should see Barack or um, Donald Trump do is start throwing around executive orders after accusing Barack Obama of, of abusing that they power. They all do that. So we'll see what the... Name the last uh, president to resist We'll see that. what the congressional leadership... Um, yeah. Because Bill Clinton Comes didn't through. do it. Sure All did. Right. Not much. All right. That was expanded under Bush and Obama. All right. Well, we'll have to leave that one there. You know, over a week ago, a close vote in southeast Michigan turned down the millage for regional transit. And since the RTA was formed back in 2012, and it took four years to get this plan on the ballot, where is the plan B for regional transit? You know, we've been talking about this recently. Um, and you look at the vote. And so Washtenaw County voted for it. Macomb County voted against it. It was a close vote in Oakland County, but they voted it down. Detroit voted for it, but then Wayne County did not. Yeah. Um, what do you make of what message that sends? Nolan, let me start with you. Well, in Wayne County, they had another big tax on the ballot and in the, in the school, on the school millage, and I suspect voters said, well, we'll go one, but we won't go two, because Wayne County is usually pretty good at passing those sort of measures. I think what they've got now is two years to figure out a plan that appeals to, that makes people who don't now ride a bus feel like, hey, maybe I can ride a bus. And they didn't send that message out strong enough in this campaign. They didn't make it about everyday commute, commuters getting another option for getting to work. I think over the next two years they can they can take some time and look where this new mobility um, business is going in terms of how you incorporate ride sharing and possibly even up the road uh, self-driving vehicles. So it's not a you know stuck-in-place bus system, traditional bus system, that they incorporate these new modes of transportation in the plan. You know, um, we often hear the phrase, you know, go big or go home. Was this too big of a proposal? Was it a 10-year plan? It's too sweeping, too yeah, much I money for argue, people to wrap their head around? Or? I would argue, if anything, they didn't go big enough. Uh, I mean, it's, it's still Go left. bigger or go home? Is, well, that, is that the new slogan for you? I mean, <laughs> part of the criticism that we heard from the suburbs was that it wasn't big enough for them. It didn't include enough of uh, the citizens who live in Oakland and Macomb County to, to merit their support. Uh, I, I, you know, I, I'm not sure what the answer is two years. I mean, um, if you looked at the plan, I thought this was a reasonable start to a regional transit system. It was designed to get people uh, from where they live to work uh, in, in ways other than in their cars. Most of it was concentrated, in fact, in the suburbs. I mean, they these cross these cross county uh, connectors between Macomb and Oakland. Those are those are the routes that are the the most choked in the metro area. I mean, people voted against their self interest here, and we have a ha you know we have 40 years of record of doing that here. And and at some point, I mean, I guess we we get the system 
we deserve. It's why people don't want to live here. It's why millennials don't want to live here. People's kids grow up and move to Chicago or they move to, to New York because uh, uh, those are places that are more uh, accommodating of of the kind of uh, mobility that people want. I agree, but you can't blame it all on the taxpayers. They were presented with a flawed a flawed setup from the beginning. We argued from the get-go that you can't have three different bus systems, two two or three different taxes. Well, but you can't wipe that buses. out in the next two years. You, you could have taken the time to wipe it out this time, and they didn't have the courage to do it. They didn't, they didn't want to take on the various interests. But, I mean, this was a very confusing proposal. These are the same people turned it down, passed the smart bus tax two years ago. So you can't blame it all right. on taxpayers. Right, they want their own this thing, they don't not, want the regional This thing. was not, that's a regional system. This is not, this it's was a not a great. regional system that leaves F the region out. This was not a great. People can opt out of. It's not yeah. a great set up when you're asking people we're going to we're going to start yet a third transit system and we're going to pay for that too that's not efficient that's not a good use of taxpayer money i think if you if you really want to solve the con the major congestion problem in metro in metro detroit you extend that um, rail line all the way to pontiac take the pressure off those north south south routes where the real issue is and ba and, and in reality that's where the jobs are too and you know, I think that would be a huge help for Ooh, the region. Do you think? Do you think that we'd see that? Do we think that we well, see that rail line go all the way up? So there are already plans uh, coming together to move it down Jefferson, uh, toward toward Gross Point once mm -hmm. it's done and open, uh, running between Grand Boulevard and, and downtown. You're talking about an awful lot of money is the yeah. issue to get it to Pontiac. Uh, that's a much longer route, uh, and, and there's no, you know, part of the problem. Uh, with what we do here is that we don't understand that when we turn down things like this RTA uh, uh, millage, we are giving away far more, in fact, in federal money. I mean, the federal government thinks transit here is a joke. Uh, literally, they laugh about uh, the efforts here to try to get stuff done, and they don't send money. They send money to communities that work together, that have plans, that have systems that actually work. And until we get to the point where we can say, all right, we're going to you know, be in on this and in on this for the long haul, we're not going to get that help. Uh, mm. They're going to have to revamp it. It'd be silly to come back with the same exact plan in two years. They're going to have to figure out what it is people will resonate to and sell it right. a little better. Yeah. They had a really poor selling job this time. Maybe start a little earlier on that. Mm. All right. Well, turning now to a conversation with Domino CEO Patrick Doyle. He was the keynote speaker at Business Leaders for Michigan CEO Summit in Detroit last week. And he shared with me what Michigan needs to do to be more competitive in landing business, plus a plan for education in the state, and what a Trump administration means for business around the U.S. Take a look. Let's talk a little bit about Michigan yep. and uh, the state of our economy right now and how businesses are able to do business. Let me ask you first off, are we doing the best we can in terms of attracting new businesses to start up here in the state of Michigan? Yeah, I mean, there's certainly still opportunities, but, you know, uh, there are always ways we can get better. We've been talking a lot at Business Leaders for Michigan about kind of, you know, some of the, uh, the attraction tools that we use as a state to bring more businesses in. But... At the end of the day, I think the most important thing um, that we can be doing as a state is, is to make sure that we're investing in the education and the talents um, of, uh, of, of the people of our citizens. Because if you've got a great workforce, that's ultimately what's going to attract in business. That's what's going to allow people to grow their businesses in the state. So not only about you know, bringing new businesses in, but it's also about capturing the growth from the existing businesses. So if we're equipping you know, our workforce better than other states, we're gonna grow faster than other states. I do wanna ask you detail about what that investment specifically means, but before we get to that, tell me what other states are doing that maybe they're, they're doing well, that maybe Michigan could be emulating when right. it comes to investing in business and bringing business here. Yeah, I think where our opportunity has been on, has been on some of the attraction tools. So it's, you know, there are states, some of our surrounding states, um, Ohio and Indiana have been very aggressive about, you know, kind of incentives to get companies to move in. We've tried, I think, more as a state to make it a great level playing field opportunity for everybody. But if you're going to get that big new plant, that big new investment, 
Um, you know, it's a competitive market out there mm -hmm. among states to bring those in, and so I think sometimes we haven't been as aggressive there as we could have been. And is it also that there there hasn't been continuity in that as well? Do you feel that there has, has been changes changed. and up and down, so businesses right. aren't really quite sure where they would stand in the, in the right. next couple of years as right. well? Yeah, I, I think that's absolutely true, and so having consistency around that, kind of putting that in place, and you know, there are things that are working their way through the legislature right now, I think, that would help that, that would give us kind of the tools that we need permanently um, to be able to attract in some of these bigger projects. All right, well that's investment, but you also said we need investment in education, and right. investment means money. So when you're specifically talking about investment in education, are you talking about higher ed? Are you looking at skilled trades, uh, K through 12? All of the above. I know, it's a little bit of D, all of the above. Um, tell me specifically what you would like to see. Yeah, I, so you know, we've been involved, you start with, uh, with pre-K in fact, and you know, and the investment into pre-K, um, you know, what we know and, and kind of all the educational research shows is that, you know, if you can get kids at, you know, three, four, five years old and get them prepared to enter school, that's where you're going to actually get your best return. Mm -hmm. So doing that, making pre-K education available to everybody is important. A lot of work to be done still on, you know, on K through 12. We haven't been as involved there, but we continue to look at that and, and, and view that as being, I think, critical for, for the state to get that right. I've personally been very involved with higher education. How do we make it more affordable, accessible? Um, and then critically importantly, how do, we, how do we drive completions? Because at the end of the day, what really drives value for people who are going in and paying for an education is the completion, is getting the two-year degree, getting the four-year degree. That's what dramatically changes kind of the economic outlook uh, for that person. So it's not just about investment and access, it's also about how do we make sure that the students that are starting are, are given the you know, the tools they need to complete. All right, um, we just had a election this week. We I heard we have, did. I know, I mean, you might have heard a little <laughs> bit about it, um, but we are going to be having President Trump in right? January. What does a Trump administration hold for American businesses? Yeah. So as a business leader and you sit back and you say, all right, what kind of change are we going to have? Right, you know, I don't know exactly what the changes are, are going to be, but I can tell you what I hope for. And what I hope for, um, is is you know an investment in a aggressively kind of pro growth agenda. At the end of the day, the way you have an inclusive society is by having everybody have an opportunity to to be involved, providing jobs and more jobs for people, um, better jobs over time. And so, you know, we're going to see as the agenda kind of is 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 rolled out i think over the course of the next hundred days as a cabinet is put together as kind of the key players in each of those areas you know get involved but i think there are a lot of things we can do from you know a broader level you know tax uh for both corporations and individuals that i think is very pro-growth doesn't even have to you know it could be revenue neutral but mm -hmm. um simply you know getting rid of a lot of the inefficiencies um, you know, the ability to attract cash that a lot of corporations, not dominoes, but a lot, you know, have overseas because the heavy tax, if they bring it back into the country, a lot of things that we can do. Um, and then critically importantly, you know, the same as for the state at the federal level, investing in people, investing in the skill sets of people, their ability to participate in the workforce, give them the tools that they need to be successful. That's, you know, that's ultimately how we're going to be, you know, successful as a country. Our thanks to Patrick Doyle, and you can watch our entire interview on our website at myweek.org. All right, guys, Thanksgiving's come up next week. It this, is. this is your favorite holiday? It is my favorite holiday. It always has been. And yeah. part of it is that my birthday is always right around Thanksgiving and often well, falls birthday, on Steve. Thanksgiving Day. This year it is the day before. Oh, so we've got a couple more shopping days left. Yeah, all right. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but it's also just, I mean, it's, it's not as frenetic, I feel like, the run-up to it as Christmas. Uh, you know, it's just a day to sort of see your friends and your family and hang out and sit and watch football and eat. And though, the parade. Though the, the I think a lot of parade. families might be a little tense this year. Yeah. So my advice would be 
just talk about everything chill. else but with just <laughs> don't chill. Talk about don't talk about politics. Put that right on the door. Has anybody uh, defriended you or not invited you to their Thanksgiving I table? Mean, <laughs> nobody's liking me right now. I'm getting it from the right and the left. But, you know, Thanksgiving is a good holiday. It's all about eating. You don't have to buy anybody a present except yeah, maybe no Steve. Good. You just need to show up. Well, now we've got to show up for Stephen's good. birthday. But no, That's all you have to do is eat. Are you guys going There's to the no parade? Other, I, well, I, I live along the parade route, so I don't have to go You'll to the You'll be pressing parade. your face against the window? But look out the window and see the balloon. Nolan, you will not be um, <laughs> you know, in the I parade. You know, I had a bad day at the parade last year. Oh, Driving right. the float? <laughs> I wrecked Mother Goose, and I think she's not even in the parade this year. <laughs> not running, right? is, she not, is it not in the parade? Oh. Well, no. it was an old float, wow, no and broke that's part floor. of the reason that it crashed, right? <laughs> it wasn't it wasn't in good shape. It, we run over several people, but <laughs> fortunately nobody was killed. Um, oh no, but I am, I think on the Saturday the 26th, I am the Grand Marshal of the Garden City Christmas Parade. <laughs> All right. That Something we'll excellent. have to look and at. And I warn them about my parade curse, so <laughs> right. it's on them. Make sure, <laughs> make sure you put a GoPro on your hat so we can see that video. All right, guys. Hey, happy Thanksgiving. That's going to do it for My Week. Make sure you check us out on Facebook and Twitter at My Week. Thanks so much again for supporting Detroit Public TV. We couldn't do programs like this one without you. I'm Christy McDonald. We'll see you next time. Take care. Did you know, Roush Enterprises was selected by Google to assemble a test fleet of 100 prototype self-driving cars in 2015. It also produced the new Domino's delivery cars. And speaking of Domino's, Domino sells well over 2 million pizzas per day around the world, and half of their sales are digital. These are just some of the ways Michigan's pioneers started out as small companies with big ideas. We are business leaders for Michigan. We are committed to making Michigan a top 10 state for jobs, personal income, and a healthy economy. Funding is also provided by Delta. Ah!